and the back door will stay open if you need to leave. There is a bathroom in the back right hand corner. The light is on the outside. Uh, the books will be available for purchase after the event and they're going to be signed after the event. Tonight we are so very honored to host two wonderful local authors and dear friends of Bear Pond, M.T. Anderson and Howard Norman. One of my very favorite things about living in Vermont is that there seems to be only one to two degrees separation between us all. The interconnectedness of our communities is part of what makes Vermont so special. I love to call things very Vermont, and I feel like this evening is just that. Not only are our guests tonight both prolific writers, they're also neighbors. Because, of, of course, one little stretch of land off the grid in East Palace would house such talent. Like I said, very Vermont. M.T. Anderson has written stories for adults, picture books for children, adventure novels for young readers, graphic novel adaptations of ancient French tales, and several books for older readers. He's the winner of the National Book Award, the Golden Duck Award, the Boston Globe Horn Book Award, and the Margaret Edwards Award. Anderson is a former instructor at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. He's known for his wit and whimsicality in his writing, and is beloved both regionally and nationally. Nicked is his first adult novel. Howard Norman is a prolific writer and novelist. He has received the Lannan Prize in Literature, as well as three fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship, and the John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship. Since 1988, he had taught in the MFA program at the University of Maryland. He's the author of numerous novels, three memoirs, children's books, graphic novels, and screen scenarios. He has twice been a finalist for the National Book Award in Fiction. Most importantly, he keeps us at Bear Pond caffeinated and spoils us with treats from Bovinia Bakery. <laughs> he lives in Calais with his wife, Jane. We are thrilled to have you both here tonight and can't wait to hear about this wonderful book straight from the source. Please welcome M.T. Anderson and Howard Norman. Uh, um, thank you so much, Emma. Uh, it's really a pleasure. Uh, to read with Tobin. Um, you don't know that yet. <laughs> and, that, and that's why. <laughs> um, broadly put, uh, we have both written historical novels, though with greatly different narrative temperaments. That's probably the biggest understatement I could make. Um, anyway, well, you will soon hear how uh, original um, that rarest of things originality, how original and splendid Tobit's novel is. Um, I'm going to read briefly from uh, Come to the Window. It's set in 1918. The Spanish flu and World War I are raging at the same time, but it's not an allegory of the time we're living in now. <laughs> <laughs> I might. Oh, this is a major technical problem for me. I don't, I don't think the mics actually transmit to the room. It's just for the uh, for Orca over there. I'll try there. to speak. I'll, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to speak louder. I'm sorry. Um, uh, um, influences on a novel they have to sustain you for for several years at least. But I thought I would just mention quickly that the. There are two things that were originally inspiring for this particular story. First, this photograph, which is, uh, was taken in the village the novel is set in, which is a, a photograph of a, a whale that, I don't know if you could see it, that was washed up in Parsborough, Nova Scotia. And um, a lot of the action of the novel takes place in that building right there behind it. Uh, all the research of it. And so the, the whale is a presence here. And lastly, um, before I just read, um, I was in a small village called Heart's Desire, and I was eavesdropping. And a man walked into a store and said to the owner of the store, um, how is your life? How, how's life? And she said, it's as busy as a day in the Old Testament. <laughs> and that just seems so vivid and, and provocative and, and, and co compelling to me that I sort of 
uh, confiscated it <laughs> and put it in, you know, seven or eight times in this book. Um, <laughs> because I just thought, you know, how busy was it doing this? <laughs> you know, and, but um, it was nothing I, so I said to her when the other guy left, I said, um, you know, I never, I never thought about how busy a day in the Old Testament was, and she looked at me and without any irony said, that's about all I think about. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just jump right in. <laughs> On his first posting as a court stenographer, Peter Lear immediately got it wrong, and I mean in the first 30 seconds. Three days ago, I was dispatched by the evening mail from Halifax to Parsboro in this small fishing outport set along the Bay of Fundy. I'm covering a preliminary hearing whose sole purpose is to determine if the facts warrant a full trial in the provincial court. It's all up to Byron Spencer, the presiding magistrate. Here's what I know so far. Elizabeth Frame is accused of murdering her husband Everett Dewis. The incident took place on the night of April 22nd, roughly 11 hours after they had exchanged marriage vows at St. George's Anglican Church. I was allowed to see their room on the top of Otto House at Partridge Island, situated right at the mouth of Parsboro Harbor. That fateful night, the newlyweds twin dormer windows overlooked a moonlit bay it was a room traditionally reserved for visiting dignitaries, which had been few. Lucy Maud Montgomery slept there when, in the summer of 1908, she'd come to read from Anne of Green Gables at the Anglican Girls' School on Victoria Street. The room has a four-poster bed, also a botanical border quilt, and otherwise white bedclothes. It has a clawfoot bathtub in the private bathroom. It has an armoire, and, beside, and bedside candles. In fact, I described the decor when I filed today's coverage with my editor, who wired directly back, saying she was giving me one column only with a heading, Whale Intervenes on Wedding Night. <laughs> I cannot wait a moment longer to mention the unusual most of all phenomenon, which is a whale presently rotting on the beach all but constantly attended by carrion gulls. In fact, it had washed up on Mr. and Mrs. Dewis's wedding night, not a hundred meters from Ottawa House. I'd been to see the whale. It's right there in front of the wooden pilings, either bloated or collapsed, depending on which precinct of its bulk and length, whether flukes, gullied throat pleats, dorsal ridge, or pale underside. A clothespin pinched my nostrils closed, but still one has to breathe. Lord have mercy, some dogs have been at the whale, crows too, a portion for foxes, but predominantly gulls, and that many gulls can be deafening. It is a gargantuan sad corpse, and I found it difficult to imagine it swimming freely, a vessel of eternity, as Herman Melville put it, through the watery depths. Standing there, stunned at how puny the human species is, I thought of what my wife, Amelia Morley said after she'd read Moby Dick, it seems that Mr. Melville has written the lost final chapter of the Old Testament. <laughs> I miss my wife terribly. Schooled in London, she was the first ever woman to be resident surgeon at Victoria General Hospital, but for the past six months now, she's been in France working with the no number seven stationary hospital out of Dalhousie University. Um, it's followed by a long letter from her. The whale's eyes were filmed over. A local fisherman, Petrus Dollard, told me, this past Sunday, the whale's stench broadcast up to St. John's Anglican Church so that some parishioners departed mid-sermon. <laughs> Rector Thomas Shrivard was none too happy about it. From what I've learned, just from day one of the hearing, the whale might be seen as the start of Elizabeth Frame's mortal difficulties. <coughs> What's more, I contend that the very sight of this whale summoned up dramatic aspects of Elizabeth's soul, mind, and spirit. Why do I suggest such a thing? Because in the witness chair, Elizabeth herself 
talked about her murderous act as if it was a biblical moment. For example, she said that she'd risen from the bed, quote, naked as Eve, looked out the window and thereby saw the, quote, spectacle of a Leviathan as if torn from the book of Psalms. She then had studied the whale for a few moments, even said a prayer for it. And it was at this point, by her estimation, somewhere around 4 a.m., she had said, darling, come to the window. A whale has intervened on our wedding night. But Everett Dewis refused her request, and a certain rage of disappointment overtook her, so that when Everett fluffed the pillow in a deliberate way that had reminded Elizabeth of someone playing a few quick notes on the accordion, <laughs> yawned and then turned away from her, Elizabeth promptly went into his leather satchel, removed his military revolver and said, Everett, here comes a dry morsel, <laughs> and shot him three times. She then threw on Everett's nightshirt and went down to visit the whale. By the way, that thing Elizabeth said, Everett, here comes a dry morsel. My room has a King James Bible in it, and I finally found the passage I was looking for in Proverbs 17, quote, better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Mm -hmm. A dry morsel, a bullet. But however as compelling as darling come to the window was, they weren't the first words Elizabeth uttered in the witness chair in the spacious dining room of Ottawa House that had become a makeshift courtroom. And therefore, they weren't the first words Peter Lear recorded. No, the instant she sat down in the latter back chair provided by Josephine Huntley, the proprietor of Ottawa House, Elizabeth Frame unprompted said, the saddest part was just a few hours before I killed my new husband in our matrimonial bed, there had been contrapuntal moans. I doubt that Everett Dewis would have found that the saddest part. <laughs> Obviously, in saying what she'd said, Elizabeth had outright confessed to the murder, and now all that was left was to hear how, and maybe a little of why, it had come about. It was as if everyone in the makeshift courtroom had to abruptly detour their curiosities from one mystery to another. I actually jotted down contrapuntal in my notebook and followed it with a big question mark. In my line of work, I'm hardly a stranger to the English language, but I had no earthly idea what contrapuntal meant. <laughs> Apparently, neither did Magistrate Spencer. He was dressed in a well-traveled black suit, white shirt buttoned at the neck, a lanky fellow, about age 55, I would guess with a kind of asymmetrical face, decidedly more vertical in structure than rounded, a luxurious head of black hair, flecked white at the sideburns, very kind browned eyes and spectacles. Anyway, Spencer stopped the proceedings. He turned to his assistant and said, Mr. Cousins, find me a dictionary. <laughs> in about 15 minutes, Bevel Cousins, the assistant, had found a dictionary in the Anglican Girls' School and delivered it and delivered it to the magistrate. Spencer had remained seated behind his desk with his eyes closed. I thought he might be taking a brief nap, but more plausibly, that was how he retreated inward. Thank you, Mr. Cousins, he said, and then he paged through the dictionary. Finally, Magistrate Spencer said, don't take this down, Mr. Lear. I'll tell you when to resume recording. I understand that you're the first male legal stenographer in the province. I believe that's true, Your Honor, Lear said. Well, well, Spencer said. How fortunate for us to have you. Thank you, Lear said. And is that the latest model of the universal stenotype machine? Yes, Your Honor, it is. And was it provided by the province, and did it come out of your salary? Yes to both, Lear said. Well, it's a handsome machine, Spencer said. It can spell any word in the dictionary to boot. Apparently, Magistrate Spencer had wanted to demonstrate his sense of irony. You may resume recording, Spencer said. On his desk, Spencer placed his coffee mug so that it propped open the dictionary and read aloud the definition of contrapuntal. Quote, harmonically interdependent in rhythm and melodic contour. 
at which point some fellow in the audience called out Elizabeth. That word's going to keep me up all hours of the night. <laughs> Allow me to uh, let's go on and on and on and on here. Um, it's a long... Uh, I sort of describe Elizabeth's physical self. Um, I found that some people exhibit their temperaments in an immediately memorable fashion. I feel that Elizabeth is one of those. For instance, I learned from Bevel Cousins that in a preliminary interview, when Magistrate Spencer asked if her childhood was happy or unhappy, Elizabeth had replied, by this moody, tremulous ocean, I've always lived intensely. And Elizabeth's own mother said, Lizzie often got words and phrases from poetry, hymns, and eventually novels, but she used them in a surprising way. I also learned from Elspeth, the mother, that at age 11, Elizabeth had said to Rector Shrevard, when I get older, I'm going to write stories. And you should know, I listen closely to every word of your sermons. So I'm putting what you say in the bank, and I'll be able to withdraw it whenever I want. <laughs> her mother then added that throughout her childhood, Elizabeth was expert at neatly tucking a warning into a compliment, which I thought was nicely put. In the witness chair, Elizabeth chose to wear the dress she was married to, uh, that she was married to Everett Dewitt in, Dewis in, a, Victoria, a Victorian style cream colored muslin two piece with 10 buttons up front, wide embroidered lapels, a silk bow in back, and a floral pattern on the sleeves and at the collar. Wearing her wedding dress for hearing about the murdering of her husband on their wedding night was one of the most off-slant <laughs> exhibits of pathos I'd ever experienced in a courtroom. She had to have put a lot of thought into wearing that dress. Looking down at her hands clasped together as if she was praying, Elizabeth thought for a moment and finally said, you see, Everett and I moaned in ways that I described as contrapuntal because I'd been taking mail order music composition lessons and recently had a whole new vocabulary. Magistrate, Dis Magistrate Spencer hit the desk with his gavel, which stopped more laughter before it had even begun. He grimaced warningly at the audience. Does your music composition teacher have a name, he said. Yes, his name is Oscar Ash. He lives in Halifax. He's Bavarian by birth, but he's applied to become a Canadian citizen. On principle, always a good idea, Spencer said. <laughs> Elizabeth hesitated a moment and then delivered a wallop of a fact. It was Oscar Ash who picked out and provided my wedding dress, which I'm presently wearing, she said, all at his own expense. The dress was part of his own proposal of marriage to me. He's a widower, you see. What's more, Oscar had no knowledge of my previous engagement to Everett Dewis. I'm sure none of this reflects well on me, but the dress fits nicely, don't you think? <laughs> so I'm going to skip ahead, read just a short other section. Um, uh, magistrate says, Mr. Lear, please scroll back the tape and read the testimony from the beginning. I must confess that at this point, Peter Lear drew my utmost sympathy, and in fact, I cringed on his behalf when shortly after he'd followed Magistrate Spencer's instruction. Lear cleared his throat and, and read, quote, the saddest part was just before I killed my new husband in our matrimonial bed, there'd been contrapuntal moons. <laughs> Whether Lear had mistakenly written contrapuntal moons and therefore had read it correctly, or whether he'd simply mispronounced moans, I did not know. Either way, no amount of gavel pounding could fend off the ensuing laughter. It just went on and on. And even Elizabeth Frame in the witness chair shook her head back and forth incredulous. Peter Lear had in equal measure a look of despair and embarrassment. He tried to carry on with reading the transcript, but Spencer said, Mr. Lear, it's fine. Please cease and desist. <laughs> and one just last short short little piece. Um, so this journalist is in 
is in um, is going around and asking people about you know sort of what happened that night and um, I just have to find it sorry So he goes and talks to this, this, this woman who was downstairs when the murder took place. Um, stiffly cordial at first, she said she'd not resist talking about what she'd seen the night of the murder. Not resist had a touch of ambivalence about it, but I was a total stranger to her. What should have I expected? I'll provide some facts, but no personal emotion, she said. How's that? Mm -hmm. That would be fine. I'm a friend of the family, after all. I understand. Well, whether you understand or not, go on and ask your question. <laughs> right away, I noticed a telescope in the corner of her cluttered room. Do you like stargazing, I said. It's quite simple. Amateur astronomy is welcome on a sleepless night. Mrs. Huntley, were you by any chance stargazing on the night of the murder? Of course, she said. I heard the gunshots. But before that, I'd been so busy looking at the Ursus Major constellation, I didn't even notice God's largest creature tumble onto the beach. Distracted by the heavens, you might say. It was only seeing Lizzie Frame walk right past my window on the porch here, wearing a nightshirt and looking preternatural. That's when I properly adjusted my telescope and followed her down the beach. She was holding the revolver in her right hand, though she's left-handed. What happened next, I said. What happened next, I will never forget. I just will never forget it. I'm all ears. Well, Lizzie stood with her forehead pressed against the whale. Through the, lamp, to, through the telescope, I saw her mouth moving like she was talking to the creature. And then she climbed up along the tail, keeping her balance, keeping her balance, keeping her balance. She mainly, on, she mainly, on all fours, got to the blowhole. And then she pressed the revolver right into it. It was a once-in-a-lifetime sight for sure. That exact thing just cannot have happened before and won't again. Because how could it? But God is my witness. That is what happened. Distraught to the point of tears, Josephine Huntley, without another word, stood up and showed me the door. <laughs> well, that was super. Um, that is, uh, that's it. it one, one of the things that was so fun is that um, you would not believe how much of that is actually real and is taken from court transcripts, which we should talk about in, yeah. a, in a minute. Yeah. Um, and it was very fun over the last couple of years uh, uh, listening to Howard's stories as he discovered all of these fragments and put them together into the story. Um, so anyway, that's something we should talk about. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, so my book, Nicked, is, um, is a, also about a real historical event, a real but somewhat bizarre historical event, which is that in um, 1087, uh, two rival groups from Italy set out in a race to try to steal the corpse of St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, from its tomb in what is now southern Turkey. Um, and uh, so it was the Venetians and the people from the city body in the south. The reason they were doing this, there are all sorts of reasons, but the, the most prominent was um, supposedly St. Nicholas's body exudes a, uh, a liquor that if you drink it, um, it will heal anything. So um, for all sorts of reasons, they decided to, to bring this back as a, uh, you know, uh, as a prize to, uh, to Bari. And uh, so this book is, uh, is based on, on real accounts of what happened, though it, uh, it changes a lot of things to kind of like turn it into a more straightforward heist novel. <laughs> um, a heist, a monastic romance, also, you know... Um, <laughs> Which, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a genre which I don't think is burgeoning sufficiently yet. <laughs> Somehow there's not a big line of like, ooh, Benedictine romance. <laughs> um, 
So I'm going to read right from the beginning, <laughs> and then I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to skip forward uh, uh, to, to essentially the pitch that a, uh, the saint stealer actually gives to the people of Bari about why he should be hired to go steal the corpse. Okay, so here's the, the beginning, and I'll actually uh, stand for this, but um, you don't need to. Um, my, my mother is actually a priest, so uh, a lot of her stagecraft involves forcing other people to stand and sit at regular intervals, but I will not do the same. The monk heard that a ship had arrived carrying one of the dog-headed people whom travelers speak of when they tell tall tales of the one-eyed and the winged, and he went out to the docks to see if it was true. This is how he first laid eyes on the relic thief. This is how the voyage to steal the corpse of St. Nicholas began. In an age of sickness, in a time of rage, in an epoch when tyrants take their seats beneath the white domes of capitals, I call upon St. Nicholas, gift giver, light bringer, wonder worker, who saved the living from drowning and pasted together the dead from their pickling jars, who even after death gave of himself in medicinal ooze, I ask St. Nicholas to tell us a tale to pass a winter night so that when we rise in the morning, we may feel resolute in the new dawn. I will tell the story of the heist of St. Nicholas's body from its tomb. I will tell it as it was told to me by musicians and drunkards and guidebooks and lovers. Though I am an unbeliever, I pray for faith. So um, I'm skipping forward to, uh, this is a scene where, um, the, the powerful men of the city of Bari all gather to hear uh, the pitch of this saint stealer. And that's a, uh, someone who steals holy relics. That was a real profession in the Middle Ages, um, though this one is somewhat unusual. Um, the abbot was surprised to see that the man looked utterly unchristian. To the Normans and Apulians gathered there, his features spoke vaguely of the steppe, of the lonely, confusing distances that drew merchants east to God knows what scenes of barbarity. And yet, there was an impudence in his eye that challenged them all to question his religion. The archbishop was appalled. This is the man? Tell them, said the duke. The Tartar surveyed all the men in the room, the powerful Abari, and then he began. I am Tien, saint seeker, relic hunter, I have traveled from Kashgar to Zanj and served many princes of the earth and friends of Christ above. You claim you can get us Nicholas. This is, this is the moment. You are sure? Chun began his pitch. The Seljuks have swept out of the steppe and across the face of the civilized world. The Arabs and Persians have fallen before them. They have taken Khorasan and Khwarazm, and now they have pushed deep into Byzantium. A Norman said, alas, Byzantium with a titter. Chena smiled. Myra, where the blessed Nicholas lies, is in a state of chaos. The Byzantines, the Seljuk Turks, no one knows who rules that city now or the whole state of Lycia. The coast there is in utter confusion. It would not be difficult to slip in, grab the corpse, and liberate the saint. Venice has asked me if I will go fetch the bones for them. This is the moment. In a few days I set off for Lycia and I will bring back the relics to Italy. He clasped his hands behind his back. If body does not want St. Nicholas, Venice does. The Venetians are bastards, a merchant clarified. <laughs> you have asked us for twice what Venice offered you, said the Duke. It is an appalling sum. So you might ask why you would want the corpse of St. Nicholas, said Tien. The Normans waited for an answer. St. Anastasia, Tien announced in a loud voice. St. Anastasia was born without hands the daughter of an innkeeper. She did what work she could with her sleeves pinned shut. One night, a husband and young wife came to the inn seeking shelter after a decree had gone out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. The wife was pregnant. There was no room in the inn. I presume you've heard this story. <laughs> they slept in the stable. His audience gaped. In the night, Anastasia, daughter of the innkeeper, woke. There was singing and the tolling of celestial bells, sort of like your cell phone, um, there was light coming from the stable. She rushed down to investigate, worried about fire. Instead, she found a glowing child laid in a manger, no crib for his bed. She knelt before him. She wished to bathe him as the midwife would do, but she had no hands. The Blessed Mother picked up the child and laid him cradled in Anastasia's arms. A Anastasia wished with all her heart that she could care for the babe as the virgin slept. And lo! 
An angel came out of heaven and delivered her a pair of hands, white as lilies. With these hands, she tended the Christ child through that long winter's night as ox and ass stood by. Cha looked upon the sitting duke and his rapt company. I recovered St. Anastasia's hands. There was an appreciative murmur from the Normans. They were of ivory and set with jewels and rare teak. I found them in a treasure house in the Maghreb. I penetrated the fortress, slipped the hands out of the vault without detection, and delivered them to the church of St. George in Fraxinetum. Within three months, Fraxinetum was drawing 500 pilgrims a day, ships arriving from all over the world, caravans coming from uh, the Alps, paying imposts. The city has repaired its walls and built a shrine. This is the power of a holy relic. Nods of reluctant approval all around. <laughs> Consider what a saint can do for a city. Venice wants to hire me to, faint, to fetch Nicholas, but Venice, Venice already has St. Mark, an evangelist, one of a set of four. <laughs> Uneasy looks among the Normans, and they don't just have St. Mark, also St. Athanasius, St. Zacharias, and the foot of Catherine of Siena. The treasure hunter was now prowling between the men, restless with the energy of expertise. Everyone has a relic. Rome's burial grounds have been picked clean. The tombs off the Via Labicana Labic uh, and the Via Appia, they're barren now, gentlemen. Not a bone left. All the Roman saints are spoken for, don't even ask. The monastery at Fulda has Sebastian and Cecilia sewn up, one pierced by arrows, <laughs> the other burned to death and then beheaded while playing the hydraulic organ. Sure, Fulda has only a few shreds of Cecilia, but they also have Urban, Felicity, Felicissimus, and Emerentina. They have Boniface, Cornelius, Callistus, who was buried right next to Cecilia, and Columbana. He spoke these names directly into the faces of the astonished merchants, smacking his hands together with each martyr. Agapitus, Georgius, Eugenia, Maximus, Vicentius, and Amarantina. I got them Columbana. Fulda is a most prosperous abbey, said the archbishop in a fever of longing. Constantinople, continued the saint hunter, seat of great Byzantium, has the true cross, of course, and also the two more disappointed crosses the thieves hung on. <laughs> they have the body of the prophet Daniel, the robe and girdle of the Virgin Mary, the hair of John the forerunner, and the rod of Moses. Gentlemen, if you wish Bari to remain a great port city, you need a saint, and you need a saint <laughs> withdraw. I can get that for you. <laughs> Nicholas is no ordinary saint. You have all heard of his holy liquor, the oil that drips off his corpse. Imagine how many will come to your city to taste it. How does it taste, Menabari? It tastes of lilies. It tastes of myrrh. It tastes of redemption. It tastes of gold. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so here we are. So, Howard, why don't you talk about the things that were actually, the bizarre things that were actually real in what you read. Yeah, I, I've never really understood, in all honesty, I've never really understood um, the difference between nonfiction and fiction. <laughs> on, on, on some level, on some essential level, because if you kind of coordinate um, uh, disparate elements and choreograph them, it, it all depends on just how well you describe things. But I would say in this short novel, I did very little imagining. Uh, I mean, I think one stops researching when one finds that what you're finding out starts to trespass on what you imagined might have happened. Mm. And, mm. and so researching this book was just a matter of listening to sermons and looking at um, sermons in Nova Scotia in this period of time are full of very personal indictments. Mm. You know, I, I love this, you know, where ministers are, would get up and say things like, we all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> and I, I just found the transparency of that very compelling. The murder itself was uh, all true. It's all in Nova Scotia archive, the murder of of, of her husband. And you, you literally did read the court records. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should know that. Yeah. The court read that. I didn't know what contrapuntal meant until I read <laughs> the court records. 
And I'm not suggesting that there isn't a lot made up. I'm just suggesting that with some books, there is just so much that's going on that, uh, I mean, needless to say what you just read, any one uh, moment of dialogue um, can stand to represent a larger circumstance. And, um, you know, Nova Scotians, I would say generally, are very understated. The, 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 the understatement um, ends up to be much more than irony. Uh, and so I just like to have people, my belief is that people are capable of saying almost anything to each other. And, and if you can capture some of that, they, your characters get to report what your research is. So that, that's just the way that I like to work. But uh, you're right, Tobin, in this book, as you know, because we talked about it so often. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so when, when, I, when I've read your book in manuscript, and I've read it several times since, I really realized that it really doesn't matter what happened or what didn't happen. What matters is verisimilitude. Mm. Just the sense of, well, it, it could have happened, and I'm going to describe it as best as I can. And a lot of people would not agree with that. They would write a different kind of fiction, and they would differentiate between um, fiction and, and, and fact. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and that's just how it works with, with, with what I like to write. So it's, I don't really like the term world building, but I think both of our novels do that mm -hmm. in a sense. Yeah, um, and so, I mean, for me, the, the mingling of fact and fiction was partially that, I mean, yes, I was trying to create a, a, a trashy adventure novel. So there was the, the <laughs> kind of like, uh, you know, uh, deviations that that necessitated. But it was also, I wanted to kind of like, I wanted it to be a historical novel that takes seriously the fact that medieval sources have a different sense of reality than ours. So it's so interesting that if you say a nonfiction source from the Middle Ages is absolutely going to include um, the miraculous, for example. And, um, and, you know, it's a lot of sources that provide important information about, uh, about social history or battles or whatever are, you know, a lot of them is hagiography, like saints' lives. So, you know, the thing that's most important to these, those authors is not the fact that, you know, like, grain ships happen to carry this much grain across the Mediterranean or something. No, what's important to them is obviously that this figure brought someone back to life. You know what I mean? So it's really interesting the fact that we talk about this, these, these nonfiction documents of the Middle Ages shedding huge portions of them because we happen to not believe in them. So I was like, no, right. I'm going to write a goddamn historical novel <laughs> based on exactly, like, I'm going to take seriously everything that medieval nonfiction assumes. So, for example, you know, like I mentioned in the bit that I read about the Seljuk Turks sweeping over, the, um, over Anatolia, essentially, um, we have almost no documentation of that, despite the fact that we know it happened. But we have a huge amount of documentation about the fact that there were dog-headed men who lived in mountains to the east. Um, and interestingly enough, the Chinese actually described the same dog-headed mountain living in mountains to the west. So I feel like somewhere there, you know, <laughs> right? So, um, like, so part of, my, part of the thing was I wanted to present just like, yeah, nonfiction, uh, like a, to take seriously their nonfiction and to write this novel as if um, I was approaching that with exactly the same kind of like verisimilitude that I would um, when other people do novels about, you know, that... that um, uh, uh, you know, with, with kind of blander takes on history, yeah, that exactly. where where you discard the part that makes you uncomfortable because it's clearly not your belief system. I you know, couldn't agree more. I mean, I think you know, a, a great linguistic crime against humanity, uh, which to me warrants a lifetime in prison, came from Kellyanne Conway, with her <laughs> with her <laughs> statement. I'm I'm not going to apologize for my politics. <laughs> uh, that came from her statement, Alternative Facts. Mm, the minute mm -hmm. she uttered that, uh, 
I, I just felt like this is about the worst thing you could hear. Wait a second, haven't we both just said that we actually are committed to them? <laughs> then this is the facts? And, and this is the reason why that a good novel, I don't I mean, this is why War and Peace is, when you go to Europe and places like that, War and Peace is often in the, in the history section. It's verisimilitude. It presents mm. something, um, and but you know these are the workings of a of a narrative imagination, not um, an alternative. I I, mm. I really think that um, what you've done with the novel is created the actual sensibility of a time in which things we would have to suspend disbelief about. They didn't. It was mm -hmm. just quotidian thinking. And that's good historical writing, it seems to me, or good historical novel writing. I, I would hope so. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, but uh, now, um, there were points in the comp uh, before, but just before the composition of this book, when you talked to me about the possibility of doing it as a nonfiction book. I, I wrote it originally like that. Okay. So what happened? What like? Well, I, I gave up on writing novels, and um, then, uh, or gave up, but just decided. You know, I I, f I felt redundant. And, um, but then uh, I had it as a nonfiction book. I just described everybody in that photograph. I researched everything. And then I read it, and it was just uh, loathsomely tedious. Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I thought, I mean, <laughs> yeah, who said that? Uh, <laughs> We'll talk later. Because um, I just thought, you know, okay, this this stuff actually did happen, and there was this murder, and here's the court case, and I had it all together. You know, it was three times longer than this book. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, it's going to be far more interesting to try to write it as a story. It was just as simple as that. Mm -hmm. um, and But maintaining most of the factual. Mm -hmm. Parts. Well, like for example, the line that gives it its name, she actually said just before she shot Come her to the husband. Window, which is a quote from, from a, um, a uh, poem. Some of you might know it. I'm sure that some of you do. Um, Come to the window, sweet is the night air. It's from Matthew Arnold, and mm. Um, mm. You, you, mm. from Dover Beach. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I, which I didn't recognize, but that, like that's such a perfect connection too. In that they that there is that sense then of like uh, wartime turmoil out there in the sea that's rolling in in that poem. Like that the the uneasiness of the sea yeah. becomes the yeah. yeah 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 yeah. That's and so it um, uh, that you know I got a letter from somebody who'd read this book and a woman and she said. Um, uh, it seems outlandish that somebody would invite their husband to look at a whale and he wouldn't come and she kills him. It seems outlandish, she said. But now let me tell you about the argument that ended my marriage. Oh. And she went on for two pages describing essentially, essentially the same thing. Wow. There's no whale and there was no murder. But essentially the same thing where she felt like, um, who are we if we don't have the capacity to see that something means something to another person in that moment? Mm -hmm. who, why stay with somebody who would ignore that? Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't as dramatic, but it was, because this is basically a marriage story in this mm -hmm. book. And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, it's just hard to, I just changed it from nonfiction to fiction. Yeah. Without without much difference. I it's much shorter mer mm. mercilessly. <laughs> yeah. The ma yeah, the made up stuff comes off with more brevity than the long-winded nonfiction. <laughs> right. That's a paradox. Right. I mean, I don't yeah. know. It's different each time. Well, should we see if the audience has any questions? Met the narrative voice, though, for you when you switch from fiction, nonfiction to fiction, right? The narrator, you had to invent, you had to come up with his voice. 
Uh, yes. Um, and of course, choosing point of view is choosing narrative distance. So this stuff is pretty much unfolding in a diary-like sense. But the, there was a narrator in the nonfiction book, which was myself describing research. And I, God, I mean, I really truly mean this. I don't mean this in a, you know how sometimes self-deprecation is a form of self-regard. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I fucked this up. And so you want somebody to say, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> but in this case, really, truly was uh, a misguided enterprise. And I thought, you know, you better change this because the story is really interesting, to me at least. But the presentation of it, uh, it, it needed um, a different energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was a narrator in the first in the nonfiction. I mean, but really, how many times can you say I went to, into the library and sat? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I mean, when you throw your own manuscript across the room, <laughs> I go, what a tedious. Now, but here, well, I, see, the thing is, I'm going to go the opposite direction. So while I was doing the research for this book, I discovered that there were several um, very substantial documents talking about these, th this heist that had never been translated um, and therefore were kind of unknown. Um, and so I decided, and um, it was too late mm. in the writing process mm. for me to actually include them as, you know, the, the facts of them in this book. I'd already kind of set my own course. So I am actually doing a nonfiction book, which will be published for teens, about the heist that's going to be, oddly enough, a very different story uh, because I discovered so much from the, this sort of treasure trove of documents oh, really? after yes. I did the, oh, yeah. No kidding. So, no kidding. Um, so I'm going to produce the long-winded, um, what did you call it? <laughs> Loathsome? Loathsomely dull version. Yours won't be. Mine um, was. Uh, like afterwards, yes. yeah. But when you when you were writing yeah, exactly right <laughs> when you were writing your book on Shostakovich, yeah, um, how, which which I can really you know hugely recommend if you haven't read this. It's just oh, oh thank you. It's just amazing, and it does not um, require any uh, genre limitations. It just it's for anybody really. I think um, how. Conscious were you of staying to not the chronology of the life, but facts? Oh, for the Shostakovich book, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Like everything in that book that, um, that is dialogue uh, was reported by somebody, though, of course, because it's Soviet, everybody is actually lying. So um, <laughs> it gives you some latitude to choose, like, um, you know, who was executed first? Uh, you know, that, I'll go with them, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 But, um, but I mean, if you put two things together, something that happened on March 1st and something that happened on March 3rd, and you, you, you put those together as if it all happened on one day. I don't do that, though. How, that, how I don't, important yeah. is that? I don't think it's important at it's all. It's not important, but I still would not do it in a nonfiction book. Um, I, would, I would use some kind of sleight of hand, maybe, to say a little later or, you know, a few days later, something like that. But yeah, but the, I mean, it's yeah. more complicated with this, uh, with the medieval story, the, the sort of 1087 story of the realities behind this, because of course, mm -hmm. they have no pretense of actually reporting anything that anyone actually said. I mean, they have people speaking to each other in poetry as these, as the, the monks that um, control the, the bones are literally being tortured. Um, they are speaking in poetry, in you know, so which is very unlikely to have, to have been true, um, you yeah. know, not so beautifully iambic. So yes, anyway, I get it. I um, get it. I so get then, it. It, then there's a thing where I have to decide, like, uh, to what extent, uh, to what what does what does quoting someone mean in that in that version? I mean, you're really just quoting the source, which who has its own slant, which I end up talking about a lot, like what are the slants of these sources and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, 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 it's beautifully done. And I have a question for you about, since we're talking about the truth behind or the actual historical, yeah. the romance in that book, I'm not somebody who welcomes romance in 
it's not something that interests me unless it's sort of in the background. Yeah. The romance in this book is one of the most beautiful ones I've, oh, I've ever thank read. Oh, thank you. And I wondered if that was a part that was completely made up, or did you find evidence of something? I'm afraid it was totally made up. <laughs> well, yeah, it's but it's a heist, and like you have to have that sort of like, you know, that sort of like film noir thing, like the Maltese Falcon. Also, I will point out a book about a medieval Mediterranean object um, being sought. Um, the Maltese Falcon, for example, all these things, you always have the sort of like <laughs> the client and the detective with this sort of like uh, attraction, but they might betray each other. But because it's fiction, betrayal is kind of hot, <laughs> you know, much more hot in fiction than in reality. But uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so no, that was made up. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I would, um, I would, yeah. I go back and forth believing and not believing in prayer, but if I had one that would be answered, it would be to have Tobin's brain for just 10 minutes. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I would ask. It's, that, that seems very, very I would just overrated. like to have very that. Overrated, you, know, just, just, okay, you, you should really come up with a new wish before you're no, no, on the spot. That's, 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 that's uh, my wish, and I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to change it. Um, and you should feel happier about romance, I think. <laughs> if it's secondary, usually as it's called zombies. <laughs> if it's, I got it, zombie romance. I get it. I get it to each his own. <laughs> That's what I feel. <laughs> that, no, never mind. Never mind. Never mind, Tobin. Don't the gentleman go there. in the back had it. Yeah. So you both have worked extensively in historical fiction, which obviously entails a lot of research. But I'm curious, what is the sort of her idea or the germination for each of these projects and was it you found the thing and that became what you wrote about or mm -hmm. were you writing about something else and mm. these were tangential to the original idea I'm just curious about the origin story of yeah I mean you go ahead Tom. You started with the whale, right? The, like I mean, what how did you stumble on that weird cache of I mean I just was in a used tchotchke store in Nova Scotia, and I found this thing, and then I, I sent it to the uh, archivist at the Smithsonian, and she wrote back, and she said it was taken in um, August of 1918, and so everything in it became a source of, resor of research, and so out of the intrinsic exhaustion of um, stopping writing fiction, uh, turning to, to just pure research. One thing after the next, after the next, after the next happened. And one of the things that I was astonished by was just how devastating the Spanish flu was in, in the Maritimes. Mm. But then when you think about it, it's a place where ships are constantly arriving. Mm. Mm. And so, you know, you, you, it, it, it just simply is cumulative. You get a little spark and something that, um, uh, you know, I guess in Yiddish it would be you know, the thing that the thing that won't leave you alone. Mm. It just won't leave you alone. It keeps accumulating around it, and um, so the inspiration was not certainly a complete tale or story. It was little snippets of things. Well, but Howard, I mean, also you did discover that there was a murder committed on the on the same day. on the same day the. Yeah. Well, washed ashore. I mean, this is not just. So like, I, th I, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I know. Um, That's pretty I've amazing. Said, I, said this I, I feel like only in Howard Norman's world would that would you just go like, hey, where did this whale photo come from? And then there's like a, a yeah. weird, like a murder that actually quotes Matthew Arnold, <laughs> happened the same night. Yeah. You know what I mean? I love the archivists at, um, at the Nova Scotia Archive in Halifax, because they get involved with your work. They, they'll call you in the middle of the night and say, I don't know if this is of interest to you, but <laughs> I go, are you kidding me? This is fantastic. And how many archivists or do that? I mean, they, the thing you're interested in, they get interested in. And so I think, you know, they, it's not that they co-write it, but they, they keep feeding uh, you with stuff. And... Um, but how do you coordinate such disparate elements? I guess that's another question with, with well, all the research in this book. I mean, the first thing for me was, as a teenager, I really loved uh, singing. I loved classical music. And there are a few pieces that are about 
the actual stories of St. Nicholas preserved from the Middle Ages, which oh. have nothing to do with the 19th century confections that we now take for granted with, you know, uh, sleighs and reindeers and claymation penguins. <laughs> so uh, in, the, in the original, there are just these extremely bizarre stories about him. Like, uh, I mean, he defeats a serial killer and then brings these children back from, from the dead who've been like hanging in pickling jars. And he, um, he, uh, he saves sailors at sea a lot, but he also like the story of gift giving began with him giving gifts began with the fact that he gave, he threw bags of gold through a window to, uh, to a family where they were about to sell the daughters to a brothel because they had no money to feed them with. So in a sense, you know, like our Christmas uh, rituals are uh, a, some sort of substitution where we're telling our children we don't have to sell them yet. <laughs> <laughs> but God knows we want to at the end of Christmas. Um, so I was like, uh, reading about these things, I was, uh, as a teenager reading these stories, I was um, in these musical pieces, that's how I really found out about them, I was like, oh wow, this is an amazing story, sometimes something could be done with this. And then, I don't know, probably 10 years ago or so, I started to look into it, and as I, I, I read a book about the historical St. Nicholas, and it mentioned in a few paragraphs that his body had been stolen, um, and I was like, whoa, yes, yes. <laughs> put on the brakes here, my friend, what's, what's this about? So um, that is, um, yeah, so like it's, but I think for me, it is always that tank, like for the Shostakovich book, the non nonfiction book, it was a thing where it was like, here is a, um, a, a microfilm that smuggled through the Middle East into the United States during World War II in the height of fighting, and it contains the score of a symphony. Why would anyone do that with the score of a symphony? So it's this sort of the peculiarity of things not making, not making sense, but suggesting something miraculous about the world. Something that the world is much more surprising than we think. And that all we have to do is look right around us and we'll see incredible things. So in fact, the examples that I've been giving about this as I've been talking um, around the country have been about my town here, Callis, Vermont, where, um, for example, and once again, we're speaking factually, this is on the historical record, Scott, um, but um, so like a, uh, there's uh, in, in North Callis, there's a house that's haunted by a ghost with a rubber nose. So the story is that um, a horse bit off the guy's nose. He had it replaced with rubber. Uh, his wife was uh, unattracted by it. So she had an affair with the, uh, the postman, but because it was callous, the postman just lived four doors down. <laughs> so he, she ran off with the postman four doors away, <laughs> taking with him the poodles that they actually were breeding. He was left alone and heartbroken, and so his ghost supposedly walks <laughs> this particular house in North Callis with a rubber nose still. <laughs> um, so there's a good example. Or the fact, <laughs> as, um, as many of you know, um, <laughs> Old West Church in Callis was a spot where, uh, where people gathered supposedly on uh, one midnight in the 1840s assuming that the end of time had come and that they were going to ascend to heaven. Um, and uh, and they, they hadn't um, sowed any crops that summer because why would you need to when you're not going to be eating that winter because time will be over. Um, they put a... Uh, uh, a um, <laughs> A clock up at the, a grandfather clock up at the front, and um, and all gathered there with this expectation that now time was going to end. And then you know the clock started ringing midnight. People screamed. People were singing hymns. People fainted. Supposedly other townspeople were peering in through all the windows. <laughs> Ten minutes later, they realized time hadn't ended, um, and they uh, they all quietly shuffled out. And then supposedly. That was why the, uh, the um, population of the town dropped quite a bit in the 1840s because they had given away their land thinking like, I'm not going to need this after the end of the world. <laughs> so that one's probably not true. Nonetheless, just the fact that all these things exist in the landscape around us, like that's my hunger is to see those moments where the world that we think we know falls apart. 
I mean, that's what I think that fiction should do in general. Like to, to, to take us away from what we know long enough that we can actually see with new eyes the things we become too used to. The, the, all of the spots that we pass on our, on our drive into town, into Montpelier, God knows, just they all fly by, they're no longer beautiful, they're not ugly, they don't exist at all. Suddenly something changes in that landscape and you're like, oh wow, I live in a beautiful place. Uh, it's, I'm glad that I'm here. Or yeah. to quote the name of one of uh, Howard's book, books, um, I, uh, I hate to leave this beautiful place. It it's all strikes the deepest chords with me, Tobin. Um, I, I will confess one thing, though. I, um, I had an out-of-town visitor, a guy who, um, within 20 minutes of being in the car with him, I realized that he was... Um, you know, ha had a severely limited um, sense of irony and imagination, <laughs> and, and I was so and I was so disgusted with myself volunteering to drive him around for four or five hours that I did something that does not reflect well on me at all. I, probably most things don't, but I, um, I I made a I I said you know there's a gravestone I'd like to take you to. It's up uh, in the Northeast Kingdom and it's um just a terrific great zone uh, and it is a um, a widow's lament and I told him what it was and he said that Howard that is just bullshit <laughs> and then I knew the best thing to do was make a bet with him so I bet him five dollars sort of gas money and this gravestone um, is the dates of a man's death and a little quote from some biblical quote and the rest of it is literally I am age 18 I'm still a fetching young woman and I live at it actually has her address it's a it's like a dating site <laughs> and and I just was so excited to, to win this money because I knew this guy would not have any imagination, could not believe it. Yeah. And um, it was such a delightful moment to see him peel off a $5 bill and hand it to me. But that's what I mean. That stuff, if you just look closely enough, exactly what you're saying, Tobin. And then you startle yourself out of the ordinary, and that's really important. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree 100%. And I think that that's probably a place we should close. And if anyone wants to ask questions or sign, have things signed, we would be delighted to do so. Thank you all very much for coming.